realize sir yeah uh, good evening friends uh, welcome to indian arthroscopy society basic arthroscopy education initiative dr shriyash kajar one of very senior members of indian arthroscopy society is here today uh, he is going to speak and teach us all about shoulder impingement especially uh, the indications of uh, uh, doing a surgery in shoulder impingement how to diagnose it and what are the technical steps of uh, shoulder decompression and subacromial decompression i think subacromial space is a space which is less understood uh, we still are not very clear about impingement and pseudo impingement which case to choose for surgery what will be the outcome of the surgery what are the technical steps of the surgery and precautions to be taken so i think uh, dr shriyash is going to put uh, light on all these points uh, it is an informal kind of uh, teaching session as always and uh, our panelists are dr siddharth agarwal from punjab and dr aditya soral from rajasthan uh, both right. are again uh, dynamic young arthroscopy surgeons who have uh, who are doing lot of shoulder work as well and i think uh, it will be a good combination of uh, shreyash presenting and uh, siddharth and aditya uh, coming in as panelists and asking questions in between uh, we have members of indian arthroscopy society our secretary dr samanta uh, bhupesh kartik uh, executive committee member of uh, indian arthroscopy society also on panel uh, dr um, sandeep berares is also on panel so i think it will be a healthy discussion uh, being an informal discussion will stop uh, shreyash in between ask questions and then initiate discussions we might also have uh, questions coming up in the chat box and uh, sandeep myself and dr samanta are going to coordinate and forward these questions to our panelists so that uh, we can have a healthy discussion so i think shreyash all yours uh, let us be let us keep it very very simple because it's a be beginners course and as we talked yesterday also day before that you also wanted to keep it a very very basic so i think let us see uh, what are the questions which we get answers from you and then we can have opinions of the panelists as well because each thing is done separately and differently by each one of us so let us have a cohesion of some opinions and then uh, come to a final conclusion uh, shreyash all yours please Welcome, Sreyas. It is always a great pleasure to have you in our in our different meetings. And Sreyas is too active in our arthroscopy group, and we are really really honored to have Sreya as a speaker today uh, as Sreyas for which which is a very very controversial topic as my boss, President IPS, had told us. So all yours, uh, Sreyas, and I welcome also my good friend Aditya and Siddharth. He is like a junior brother to me, and Bhupesh is also a very learned guy. and also sandeep is there so go ahead sreyas whatever questions will come where bhupesh and sandeep and ips they will take take care and we will discuss just like a friendly home sort of in a close group of meeting okay okay go ahead uh good evening everyone and firstly thank you to the indian arthroscopy society uh, executive committee the president uh, ips oberoi secretary sonindu samanta for really uh, you know uh, asking me to talk on uh, this topic it's really an honor and uh, i don't consider myself an expert uh, you know learning is an ongoing process and a lifelong process so i hope that you know with whatever information we discuss as a group today we will all come out with some uh, learning points uh, on this uh, very debatable topic of subacromial impingement syndrome uh, i'll just uh, share my screen now so let me tell you why i chose shreyash i think shreyash has got a very very strong academic background and his work into no honestly shreyash and he uh, looks into literature quite uh, sincerely and very seriously including registry data as well so i think because it's a controversial topic people are not sure because when we started shoulder arthroscopy we were doing huge amount of subacromial decompressions and suddenly we started to realize probably indications are limited and then so i think choosing shreyash was because of simple reason that he is a guy who is into lot of academic work as well and so he will be giving us uh, his his own perspective as well as literature perspective as he goes uh, through his presentation thank you very much for the kind words both you and uh, swanendu it's really an honor uh, an absolute uh, pleasure to you know participate uh, so subacromial impingement is what i'm going to talk about uh, i i am from mumbai and i work uh, in kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital and doing exclusively arthroscopic work for the last 9 uh, years since i have joined there and relocated from uk 
So the subacromial space, to just uh, revisit the anatomy, uh, is, uh, ba is boundaried by the floor, which is the head of the humerus, uh, the lateral or the anterior lateral edge of the acromion, along with the coracoacromial ligament, and the part of the AC joint. So these are uh, the three main uh, boundaries, and the contents of this space are the subacromial bursa and the rotator cuff, predominantly the supraspinatus tendon. Now, this subacromial space, if you look on a radiograph, is determined, it's a potential space. So it is determined by uh, or measured through an acromial humeral distance, uh, which is from the summit of the humeral head to the undersurface of the acromion on a true AP X-ray, uh, which is a Gracie view. And that distance varies between one to 1.5 centimeters. So we can always compare it to the contralateral unaffected side. And what is noted is that as the arm is taken into abduction and internal rotation, this distance reduces and that uh, kind of contributes to the pathology of uh, impingement. Now, the subacromial impingement syndrome, as it is termed, uh, represents a spectrum of pathology. So it starts with some form of bursitis in the subacromial space. It then progresses uh, untreated to some form of tendinopathy involving the rotator cuff tendon. Thereafter, if again unresolved or not reversed, it will progress to partial thickness rotator cuff tears, which will then go on to have full thickness rotator cuff tears. Now, the etiology as far as this problem goes is multifactorial. In the early years, it was predominantly considered to be uh, due to wear from the extrinsic impingement or related to trauma. But of late, in the last uh, couple of decades, a lot of interest has uh, come into a theory of intrinsic tendon degeneration, predominantly because what a lot of histology studies showed is that there is lack of intrinsic tendon healing. So what is this extrinsic theory? The extrinsic theory involves a compression which is contributed by the acromion, the coracoacromial ligament, and the AC joint. So the anterolateral part is predominantly involved, and this is thought to be the extrinsic cause of impingement uh, during the overhead rotation maneuver. So near as early as 1983, based on this extrinsic theory, described three stages of impingement. Stage one, where there was edema and hemorrhage of the cuff and the bursa, and this is reversible. Stage two, when there is fibrosis and tendonitis of the rotator cuff tendons, this unfortunately is an irreversible phenomenon. And stage three, when there is a rotator cuff involvement, either in the form of partial or full thickness tear. And again, this uh, progression or this stage is irreversible without any intervention. Vis-a-vis, -vis, there was also a Bigliani from the USA, which uh, identified certain acromial morphology on radiographs, uh, which could predispose to this extrinsic theory. And he classified three types of acromion, type one, which is flat, type two, which is curved, and type three, which is hooked. And it was predominantly the type three or the hooked acromion, which was thought to contribute to this extrinsic theory of impingement and its uh, natural sequelae. So as far as the eccentric theory goes, what is proposed is that with shoulder movement, there is subacromial contact and coracoacromial ligament bending. If this continues and there is repeated forces over a period of time, it would lead to further bending of the coracoacromial ligament, thereby causing degenerative changes, which lead to ossification of the coracoacromial ligament secondary to repeated tensile forces. And that would cause or form a proliferative acromial spur. And what has been seen is that this incidence of ossification or proliferation is uh, higher with increasing age. And it is important to recognize that the acromial shape uh, as described by Bigliani remains unchanged, but it is the calcification or the ossification of the CAL ligament or the coracoacromial ligament which uh, increases or contributes to the acromial spur. Now, the other theory of late is the intrinsic theory, which looks into a change within the intrinsic architecture of the tendon. And that has been contributed because of a zone of avascularity identified 
over the uh, near the attachment site over the of the tendon to the greater tuberosity and this again with shoulder maneuvers causes repeated insult and uh, degeneration over time because of avascularity now what the intrinsic theory showed that this initially it starts with tendinosis and then lower down the ladder it will progress to partial and full thickness tears and the progression of healing will only uh, happen if you attend or reverse the pathology over time so as per the intrinsic theory the proposed mechanism for impingement was degenerative changes or trauma which would lead to weakness within the supraspinatus tendon and that causes loss of centering of the humeral head on the glenoid which causes the humeral head to migrate superiorly and thereby narrow the subacromial space and this leads to the greater tuberosity abutting against the undersurface of the acromion causing tuberosity erosion and acromial spurs so whatever uh, theory we believe whether extrinsic or intrinsic what is known about the natural history of subacromial impingement syndrome is that it starts with impingement either because of trauma or some sort of a vascular insult and eventually it leads to disruption of the cuff and arthropathy over time due to its progression if untreated now there are also certain secondary causes for impingement commonly tuberosity fractures either non union or mal union a mobile type of os acromiale calcific tendonitis the presence of instability and could be iatrogenic factors now when we see a patient in the clinic they they describe the pain to be around the anterolateral aspect of the arm and there could be associated weakness either because of cuff inhibition because of pain or if the pathology is advancing into some form of a cuff tear and the pain prevents or limits the shoulder movements and therefore they may or may not have associated stiffness on exam the commonest finding is pain on elevation more than 90 degrees what we describe it as the painful arc and also patients at times may describe it of pain when they lift the items away from the body so these are the commonest and consistent features Uh, in terms of history and examination now when we when we examine to rule out subacromial impingement syndrome there are certain dedicated tests and one test is called the need sign in which you uh, take the arm into uh, passively into forward flexion and if there is pain over the anterior or the anterolateral aspect of the uh, uh, acromion then it is a positive uh, sign there is also a need test when in in within the presence of a positive sign if you inject uh, say around 10 cc of local anesthetic into the subacromial space and you repeat the test and if it becomes painless then it's called a positive need test which confirms a subacromial pathology the next test is the hawkins kennedy test in which the examiner brings the arm into 90 degrees forward flexion and adduction and internal rotation and that re reduces the subacromial space because of the greater tuberosity abutting against the uh, anterolateral aspect of the acromion or the coracoacromial ligament thereby causing pain to the patient the other test is the painful arc which we are all familiar with wherein passively you take the arm up uh, all the way to elevation and then you ask the patient to bring the arm down and they would have a painful arc between 90 to 120 degrees of uh, reverse abduction now it's also important to recognize that there could be a subacromial impingement test which could be positive because of other associated problems and the three tests which i described the knees uh, sign the painful arc and the hawkins kennedy they are all sensitive but they are not specific for subacromial impingement what it means is that if the test is positive you have to rule out other possible causes like cuff tear uh, to be one of the reasons for a positive test now to rule out other possible reasons for impingement certain additional tests involves the kibler's assessment looking for scapular dyskinesia and what we are trying to assess from behind is that what is the range or the rhythm of the scapula in forward flexion and reverse forward flexion one important thing to remember is that certain bad postures which involves protraction of the scapula and thoracic uh, flexion 
can also lead to impingement. So we really need to identify this because this would resolve with physiotherapy and there is no mechanical cause for impingement. The next test, would, uh, to, uh, which is a useful test for scapular uh, contribution is called the scapular retraction test, wherein the examiner holds the scapula and uh, performs the needs uh, sign against resistance. And if the pain is reduced by supporting the scapula or retracting it, that means it's a positive scapular retraction test. The next test is the scapular assistance test in which firstly a forward flexion maneuver is performed by the patient. And if the patient has pain, the examiner standing from behind supports the medial border of the scapula and also the inferior angle to assist with the forward flexion. And if that resolves the patient's pain, that means the, it is predominantly due to scapular uh, dyskinesia and the scapular assistance test is positive. Now, there are other special tests if rotator cuff pathology is uh, contributing to the impingement type of uh, phenomenon, uh, like the bear hug test, the empty can test, the external rotation test. But obviously, uh, I'm not going into the details because uh, the focus on today's uh, topic is subacromial impingement. Also, you can test uh, in different ways for the sub -sub subscap and the infraspinatus and teres minor. Now, as far as imaging goes, for this type of pathology, a uh, plain AP view or a true AP view uh, is important. Uh, and what we are looking for is the presence of an acromial spur and also the so-called sorcil sign, which means that because of impingement, there is a sclerosis on the undersurface of the acromion. On the AP radiograph, we are also looking at calcific tendonitis, which could be a source of impingement. Now, it is also important to remember that studies have shown that these X-ray findings may be present even in asymptomatic subjects. And uh, acromial humeral distance, if measured compared to the contralateral side, is a better uh, indicator to reflect on subacromial impingement than the shape of the acromion. Another view which is commonly used is the scapular lateral view, where one can see the type 3 acromion or the axillary view to rule out an os acromiale or an AC joint uh, arthritis. Ultrasound, again, is another investigation which is helpful. And here it is showing a calcific deposit. And on the image on the right, there is a presence of a supraspinatus tear. MRI for patients who do not resolve with the initial line of management uh, is helpful. And one of the commonest features are uh, tendinopathy or tendinosis or thickening of the supraspinatus tendon, the, the presence or absence of uh, acromion with the spur, inferior spur, the AC joint uh, arthrosis with an inferior osteophyte. And the spur can be better seen uh, on a sagittal oblique view. And sometimes the uh, coronal views can pick up any early rotator cuff pathology. Now on MRI, the typical findings for subacromial impingement is the presence of bursal thickness, which is more than three millimeters, the presence of fluid medial to the AC joint, the presence of fluid in the anterior aspect of the bursa. However, it is important to remember and recognize that an MRI is performed with the arm adducted and the position of impingement is abduction and rotation, and it does not truly recreate that position. So this is one of the drawbacks of uh, MRI imaging. So in summary, the diagnosis of subacromial impingement has to be a combination of history taking, physical exam and imaging because no one test or one image can help us in accurately confirming or refuting the diagnosis. Shash, I think we, we just take a break two minutes here and sure. have some questions so that we, before we go to management. Should so, I uh, stop sharing? Or? No, that's okay. That's okay. I think uh, okay. Siddharth and... Uh, yeah. Uh, Aditya, so if you can add on something or if you have some issues uh, regarding the diagnosis, uh, we can discuss right here. Dada, Samantha. Uh, Dr. Shirash, uh, uh, it was yeah, nicely summarized. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Siddharth, first you. Yeah, sure. It was nicely summarized. The only thing is about the imaging. Uh, one thing you rightly pointed out that the MRI is required in the position of the actual impingement. But how practical is it in the uh, in the actual scenario to get it in a actual recreated uh, position? No. So as you as you kind of hinting, it is not possible at all. 
but what the message here was is that if you have a true subacromial impingement without any cuff pathology then you may have to just look for positive finding which were bursitis or some fluid the rest of the mri scan may be normal okay and i think if if i may just start you know i would like to reemphasize because this is a basic arthroscopy session and most of the people who are joining us are either new or pretty recent into the field um i mean i'm sure most of uh, us would agree on this uh, reemphasizing what dr shyas said you know we 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 uh, what i've seen is as a new entrant we probably get to enamored by tests like the hawkins in particular or the mt can sign and what we fail to realize is that the sensitive the specificity of this test to an impingement is actually quite less taken isolated so i've seen many people who just diagnose a bacterial impingement doing some form of hawkins it's not even hawkins what they do so you know for everybody who is joining and who's starting it new who's new to the shoulder just make sure that um, you know you're not emphasize you're not giving too much emphasis on one particular sign i think like dr shia beautifully told us or depicted you know it's the entire gamut of um, the physical examination the symptoms as well as what you find on the imaging and then you reach a diagnosis I correct so just it. just along those lines if i may just add that there was a study performed by uh, radhakant pandey published in the british jbjs in 2012 where he divided patients into three groups and what he found is that if you have a uh, four test positive so if you have the need sign if you have the needs test if you have the hawkins test and you have a, if you have a painful arc if these uh, uh, patients do not respond to conservative line of treatment for 3 to 6 months then surgery will ensure that they have a pain free uh, shoulder because there is a lot of controversy and obviously i was going to talk about it in the management as to you know does surgery have a role in this pathology at, uh, at all so these tests definitely play a role and these four tests will kind of suggest a subacromial impingement but they are not as you aditya mentioned they are not specific to say that definitely there is subacromial impingement because there could be additional pathologies which would lead to a positive test right and scapula in particular i think uh, like you demonstrated in the videos i mean it's absolutely imperative for anybody who's doing a shoulder examination to see what is happening at the scapula yeah. uh, you know most of the ladies who come to us are wearing either sarees or salwar kurtas and you know you're you have inhibition examining those patients well um you may not be able to inspect it but i think palpation and supporting the scapula they are absolutely mandatory for anybody who's examining the shoulder absolutely and also examine from the front the back and the side again this is very right. important right i think i think adit you missed the lecture probably the last week the man himself dr kibler was there in the in our forum he came for this scapular dyskinesia and the question probably siddhas was asking i think shreyas how much you rely on this uh, ultrasonography because it is dynamic you can go ahead with the both the sides if you have good musculoskeletal guy we in your team do you rely on ultrasonography of the both the shoulders just to uh, have a look for the impingement uh, so uh, this uh, all the imaging or uh, the three types of imaging were mentioned in the interest of covering the topic routinely uh, unless somebody presents to me with say acute pain then i would like to rule out calcific tendonitis as the cause so i would do an x ray so otherwise routinely on just on history and clinical examination i base my diagnosis uh, of subacromial impingement I, i don't go for any imaging right away but certainly if uh, the patient does not respond after 3 to 4 weeks or not progressively getting better then yes an ultrasound would be a easy cheap uh, investigation modality or failing which an mri if you are suspecting an advanced like a stage 3 type of a pathology uh, shreya uh, do you in your routine practice as well do an outlet view to see for uh, the bone spur is uh, it not difficult to for the radio radiographer to actually do this uh, x ray so i must confess that i use the scapular lateral very very commonly and yeah. i will tell you why because what happens is both in the ane and the uh, x ray opd setting uh, there are technicians who will just lift the arm up now if you are seeing a patient with a fractured shoulder for example you know you are going to displace it with an axillary view so the screening view or my first uh, view of choice for a lateral x ray is uh, mm -hmm. a scapular lateral and only in cases of instability uh, obviously in a subacute or a chronic setting would i go for an axillary view or if i need to see ac joint pathology 
IPS, I completely agree with you. If you are suspecting any of this hypochromial issue or for a cough, your scapular Y view is mandatory. In my outlet clinic, it is mandatory. It is mandatory. View is a, I think it should be a routine for all of us. Our radiographers take a bit of time to get adapted. But once you train them, it becomes life becomes very easy because MRI every time, all the time does not give a very reliable. Most of them overestimates the issue, issues. And you can have a clear bony spur visible on the Y view. If somehow somebody has not gone and done a scapular Y view, but, but it walks with you in your OPD with an MRI, which obviously also has a, a Y view. So would you yes. actually send him back for an X-ray or uh, would that him. image would be good enough? I actually no. send him. No, I think, uh, see, what we want to know is just identify the pathology if possible. And an MRI is actually a more detailed... Uh, uh, you know, uh, imaging techniques or modality. So I would certainly rely on MRI. Uh, X-ray generally is for osteoarthritis uh, or some sort of, uh, you know, bony problem, which I'm suspecting. And yes. I think if I may just probably add to this, um, you know, what we have to understand is that subacropial impingement is mostly a dynamic problem. Um, there may be a static component to it, but at the end of the day, what you're looking at is a dynamic issue, which is evolving. So I think clinical examination in particular itself would be would be more more or less you know it will it will take you to where you want to reach before you get an x-ray i guess that is true uh -huh. but the issue is there are so much overlap that the patient would be having a typical impingement a partial cuff injury and a scapular dyskinesia as well yes most of yeah. them most of them most of them would have actually an overlap of everything everything so it is that is why it is a bit of a challenge which patient to choose for a surgery? And I think uh, then Shriyash probably in his... Yes, sir, I have two questions over. for you here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, yes. for, for more than a, for nearly 15 years with a lot of love, I've been trying to uh, examine shoulders and never understood them properly, especially the subacromial impingement. Because as uh, our president was saying, it is a gamut of problems which will stay under an umbrella called impingement. Essentially, for me, all these tests are trying to uh, kind of squeeze the bursa and rotator cuff between the acromion and the greater tuberosity, depending on the site of the uh, pain generating area, few tests may be positive, few might be negative. But clinically, I was never able to say this is a case of partial tear or this is a case of bursitis alone. So what is your take on this? We all know in our final year MS, we studied so many uh, signs for impingement uh, very diligently, but it all depends on the place where there's the uh, you know site of inflammation. Sometimes something like this is painful. Sometimes something like this is painful. Sometimes an empty can is painful. Sometimes just a painful arc is painful. So your views on that. So and yeah, you're quite right, Bupesh. And that's what these tests have shown that they are sensitive, but they are not specific for a pathology. Yes, yes. And also there is so many uh, structures in that anterior lateral area, like the biceps tendon, you know, the right. tuberosity, the uh, CA ligament, the anterior lateral edge of the acromion maybe a calcific, uh, you know, tendonitis. So, yes. So, and that is why uh, there is a, there is a urge uh, in, in the recent literature to call it as an anterior shoulder pain syndrome rather than a subacromial impingement syndrome, you know? Yeah. And so to answer your question about how to identify, again, it's, it's a combination of what I mentioned, history taking, clinical examination and imaging. But mm -hmm. what I would do is to differentiate a subacromial pain uh, versus a cuff is to try and do the needs uh, test. Yes, what yes, happens yes. is if that pain uh, is eliminated, then you know that, you know, and then you can test the cuff strength because the cuff strength could be weak either because of pain. So you're eliminating the pain by doing that injection. And if the cuff strength is normal or near normal, then you probably have ruled out uh, a cuff tear. But yes, partial tears actually are very difficult to be, uh, you know, 100% uh, uh, accurate about. So Obviously, it's a combination of uh, imaging eventually if the patient fails the initial conservative management. But right. Shreyas, truly speaking, who is doing actually the NEARS test in the OPD? IPS, have you, have you, last time when you did this NEARS one? Uh, maybe when whenever there is a conference and people want me to just go. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is very underutilized. It should be utilized, but it is, however, very underutilized. You are, you are absolutely right, Swanandu. And even I, I can't remember when is the last time I really did that test. So, yeah. I will tell you one of the things is maybe call it our laziness to not do it. But in UK, when I was training, 
they used to do it very often the reason being that because of the workload they want to try and refer patients for physiotherapy first for you know 3 to 6 months period before they can offer them surgery if necessary so in the clinic what used to happen is they used to inject and then do it the other thing again i'll mention in my subsequent slides is that we may inject but it may not be accurate so if you don't get an accurate injection in the right space it may not give us the you know the expected uh, response yeah, if you are looking yeah, for yeah if it's yeah is it fair enough to say that in these times ultrasound examination dynamically very quickly in the uh, clinic itself in the in the opd room itself might be of value to identify partial tears from uh, just tendinosis correct so partial tears and maybe calcific deposits which are not picked up on x ray i think in the, in the spectrum of subacromial impingement syndrome that would be my two uh, indications for doing an ultrasound and also you know that time if required they they we could give them an injection and see you know ultrasound guided so it yeah. serves double purpose i have one more small doubt uh, on the imaging part uh, now uh, i always do a scapular y view uh, like dr siddharth uh, said i think it is very important but we see a lot of lateral spurs in the ap view now biglani's classification is all about anterior and the ca ligament coming in and joining the anterior aspect alone but what is the importance of these lateral spurs have we started giving more insight to these lateral spurs that are not seen in biglani's classification those are seen in ap views but and uh, what is your opinion on these lateral spurs so if you look at literature initially at the time of needs theory it was all you know considered a very important source or cause of extrinsic compression but of late in the last several decades the proponents of the intrinsic uh, mechanism uh, feel that you know it does not matter and sometimes it has been shown that if you don't take the x ray properly a uh, curved acromion may appear as a hooked one so you know a proper x ray also is uh, necessary so we don't know what came first the chicken or the egg and you know currently both theories are right or wrong but we certainly know that you know once we uh, deal with this in the way i've just uh, described as per the current available evidence then generally we can get some information on this condition yeah samantha you are mute move ahead now i think with the magic yeah, let's move some part we have already been done so yeah. we can sriya so we can go ahead okay uh, so then we talk about management now broadly speaking uh, as with uh, all aspects of medicine there are, and surgery rather there are there is a non surgical option and a surgical option now non surgical options are uh, use of medication which are anti inflammatory agents to relieve the inflammation uh, with or without injections now i will just mention uh, briefly about injections although we can take it up in the discussion in more details so as far as the injection in the subacromial space goes there are two ways of doing it either from the back or from the side uh, in my routine uh, clinic if and when i have to do it for my subacromial i tend to go from the back Uh, just like how i would do a subacromial access form during my arthroscopic procedure the reason being that in a good number of patients with true subacromial impingement because of the acromial slope or the acromial spur one may not be able to get the needle through the lateral approach and therefore the posterior approach is uh, easier and what i tend to do is i just walk the needle to feel the bone and then i just go underneath it and incline my or drop my hand down and then you can reach the subacromial space and also when you inject uh, it will be a free flow so uh, that is uh, as far as the subacromial injection goes also another cause of impingement as i mentioned uh, is the underhanging ac joint osteophyte so again that can be done and the best way to gain access to the ac joint uh, which again at times if the, there is ac joint uh, arthrosis to a significant grade we may not get but it's a vertical uh, needle going down through the space and again you just walk it between the space you feel it uh, as a surface anatomy and then you inject uh, compared to the subacromial space only about 2 cc will go into the ac joint whereas here you can inject up to you know 10 to 20 ml and after that one can go for physiotherapy which involves uh, range of motion exercises uh, which and also rotator cuff and scapular muscles um you know reeducation 
and subsequently the rotator cuff strengthening program. Now, as far as the management goes, uh, what has been found is that since Mead's impingement description in 1972, uh, surgery, which in the form of acromioplasty and bursectomy had been the gold standard for patients unresponsive to, cons to conservative treatments. But in the last several decades, authors have challenged the need for surgery in this condition because a more com comprehensive understanding of the pathogenesis has led to several publications which question the benefit of decompression surgery because of the intrinsic uh, theory to be the predominant reason for this uh, type of syndrome. Now, what is the evidence? So if we treat a patient non-operatively, as of date, currently we can safely tell our patients that it will give satisfactory results at two years in 60 to 70% of cases. Although there are, there are small number of studies which have shown that it completely resolves the pain and the problem in 70 to 90% of cases. But again, these studies have small numbers. Also, the follow-ups are short. Uh, and in the absence of major structural damage, uh, in the present day, there is very good evidence. So there is enough evidence to suggest that multimodal treatment in the form of medications uh, with or without injections and physiotherapy for at least three to six months would be the initial line of treatment for treating an isolated subacromial impingement syndrome. Now, moving on to the surgical option, uh, what has been described as the gold standard is a procedure called arthroscopic or initially it was done open subacromial decompression. And the principles are a debride or thorough debridement of the subacromial bursa, a resection of the caracoacromial ligament. However, in presence of a large or massive rotator cuff tears, one needs to preserve the CA ligament to prevent the subsequent anterior superior escape. Uh, excision of the anterolateral edge of the acromion, which is a source of impingement, along with uh, excision of the underhanging osteophytes uh, from the AC joint or an AC joint resection, depending on the extent of the pathology. So uh, for this type of procedure, I do all my shoulder arthroscopies in a B chair. And the three portals which are used for a subacromial decompression are the posterior viewing portal. And I'm sure last week, uh, Swanendru had uh, covered that uh, up. Then the anterior access portal for initially a glenohumeral joint evaluation and subsequently uh, as an instrument portal for the subacromial space to do my acromioplasty and if required an AC joint resection. And the lateral portal, which is again, a, a instrumental come viewing portal to do an acromioplasty. Now, the steps in which I proceed to uh, do a subacromial decompression are as follows. So initially, uh, from the posterior mark, surface anatomy is as uh, routine and it's very important. Uh, so I inject around 10 cc of normal saline with the one in one like saline adrenaline into the glenohumeral joint. And once I, in, so I feel for the, I feel for the coracoid and I point the needle into the joint and subsequently I take a puncture hole through the, uh, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. And then using the trocar cannula, uh, a blunt trocar, I aim towards the coracoid process and I gain access into the glenohumeral joint. When I move on to the subacromial uh, access, which is the topic for today, I will either use the same portal or I will create a slightly more proximal or a superior portal because I like to have my scope or my cannula parallel to the slope of the acromion. So in cases where I'm able to achieve that through the posterior glenohumeral portal, I will just go through that and I will aim towards the anterior lateral edge of the acromion. So I'll place my, uh, you know, this is the right shoulder. So I'll place my left uh, finger and thumb into the anterior lateral edge. And with the trocar and cannula, I will aim for this spot. Uh, of, and obviously the, the you know the light uh, or the illumination of the uh, once i connect the camera will help us establish a lateral portal which is initially an instrument and subsequently a viewing portal so this is how uh, i routinely would do an arthroscopic subacromial decompression with or without additional pathology treatment so this is the left shoulder beach chair position I have gained access into the subacromial space. Initially, I don't start the fluid flow till I see a white uh, bursal layer. And after that, 
uh, I try and withdraw the uh, cannula and sheath uh, to get the end, uh, maximum view and you, from the lateral portal two centimeters below and post posterior to the anterolateral edge, I gain the access. Then I use a trocar to widen it. Uh, and subsequently I use the radio frequency and I feel for the acromial bone first and make sure that I can do an initial resection of the bursa and that overhanging fibrillation or acromial uh, degenerated periosteum. And then I go into a more meticulous exposure of the acromion, both anteriorly and anterolaterally. Now, anterolateral is very important because studies have shown that the coracoacromial ligament extends to the anterolateral edge. So we have to release it till we see the deltoid fibers. But this ligament should not be released in large or massive tears to prevent any escape. So this uh, exposes the acromion from a posterior viewing portal. Thereafter, I introduce the burr from that. This is a four millimeter burr. A barrel burr is preferred than a rounded burr uh, because it, it is more safe. And the procedure is that you uh, spin the burr first and then you make contact with the bone. And with gentle continuous movement from back to front, you either grow from the lateral to the medial border or you go from the medial to the lateral. But lateral to medial is easier because you may have an overhanging uh, acromion or a spur or an osteophyte. So then it subsequently becomes easy. And I take the entire anterolateral edge off as described uh, uh, as a, a you know, acromioplasty procedure. And then I gradually progress to the more posterior part of the acromion. Again, I don't be over enthusiastic and I just get a little bit of cancellous bone to ensure that there is some bleeding and also it kind of cleans up that uh, inflammative space. Then I introduce the trocar and I swap my uh, viewing into the lateral portal and my instrument, which is a radio frequency device, comes in from the posterior portal. And this really gives me, uh, give, gives me the slope of the acromion and, and it acts like a jig to allow me to re, uh, you know, resect the acromion safely. So I use the slope as the jig this is called the Mumford procedure or the cutting block technique. And I start with any uh, pending anterolateral resection and then go on towards the posterior aspect. This also allows us a good visualization of the lateral part along with the excision of the CA ligament, which is equally important because remember the impingement is both anterior and anterior lateral. And that more and I try and get a smooth surface all throughout. So this more or less completes the, the burring or the acromioplasty so-called. And whatever bursa I subsequently need to resect to visualize any underlying pathology like a rotator cuff tear is done. And if not, then a thorough excision of the bursa has to be done both front side and back. Now, it is important to highlight this cutting, the principles of this cutting block technique, which I just mentioned. So initially you use the burr from the lateral portal, you're viewing from the posterior portal, but then subsequently the viewing portal becomes lateral and the instrument portal becomes posterior. And you can see here in this diagram that you know you can get the acromion to serve as a jig like we have for a knee replacement. So you can ensure that you don't over resect the acromion or cause any iatrogenic fracture. So what we are end result is that we have removed this black, which is the extra part of the acromion and we've got a nice cutting block as you can see here as the uh, final outcome. So post-operatively, if it is just a subacromial decompression for an isolated problem, the patient keeps a sling just for pain management for the first 24 to 48 hours. Thereafter, immediate passive stroke active assisted and active range of motion exercises are encouraged depending on patient comfort. And at three to four weeks, uh, resistive exercises uh, are started and six weeks onward, one can progress to advanced strengthening. So by the three months period, most patients are ready to get back to their high level activity if uh, required. Now, off late, uh, because of the intrinsic theory being the major uh, belief as the source of subacromial impingement, there is a controversy whether should we do subacromial decompression in the form of acromioplasty or not. So currently there is limited evidence uh, which shows that performing a subacromial decompression along with a cuff repair, for example, will significantly improve patient outcomes. The rationale uh, or the theory in doing a subacromial uh, decompression is that it is based on the principle that the acromial morphology is the initial cause of rotator cuff dysfunction and subsequent tear. And another alternative explanation could be that rotator cuff failure as a consequence of eccentric ten, uh, tensile overload 
uh, as a rate or uh, as a rate greater than the ability for the cuff to repair itself so you know you're trying to kind of create a healthy mechanical uh, you know space and the advantages which i feel and this is why i kind of do a judicious subacromial decompression even if my cuff repairs is that it can improve the surgical field of view it will also encourage bleeding into the subacromial space to hopefully bring in some stem cells for our cuff healing and create a more importantly a spatial environment for me to do my rotator cuff repairs however there are certain disadvantages in doing this procedure in the form of adhesion formation between the acromion and the rotator cuff tendon which may subsequently add to or limit smooth motion uh, following the repair and this was one paper way back 8 years ago which really questioned the role of subacromial decompression in association with uh, full thickness rotator cuff repairs now if one were to perform acromioplasty for the reasons i just mentioned that being a bleeding surface to bring in some stem cells and secondly to increase the space of viewing and subsequent instrumentation for rotator cuff repair what is important to remember and uh, recognize and use in our practice that basic science studies have shown that just a modest anterior bone removal is all that is required to re to reduce the pathological contact of the rotator cuff and complete flattening of the acromion is rarely needed so this is very important and this is what one needs to do if you are a believer of an acromioplasty now there are some short term studies with short patient numbers but this was one long term study which has been recently published in the american journal of sports medicine in 2018 wherein the authors followed the patients up for 10 years there were patients divided into three groups group 1 were just conservative line of management in the form of medications injections physiotherapy was performed group 2 where a open uh, subacromial decompression and acromioplasty was performed and group 3 when an arthroscopic subacromial decompression was performed and what they found is that for patients who have not got better with uh, conservative line of management for 3 to 6 months surgical treatment appears to give better long term results than physical therapy alone however what they noted is that there was no significant differences among patient in terms of presence a uh, full thickness rotator cuff tears if treated conservatively and progression to osteoarthritis over time again one of the limitations of this study is that this study originated in the late 1990s so you know a lot of treatment protocols were different than what we have followed uh, till today but as a general rule if you were to look at the indications of doing a subacromial decompression they would be predominantly a failed conservative line of treatment for the first Uh, three to six months, the presence of extrinsic causes like greater uh, tuberosity, malunion or nonunion, uh, a calcific deposit for which we need to do uh, excision, and in combination with an anterior capsular release, if we were to aim for forward elevation and abduction or rotator cuff surgery. So these four would be my indications in the present day for doing a subacromial uh, decompression, and just for an isolated subacromial impingement syndrome. i would uh, resort to a conservative line of uh, treatment for 3 to 6 months before offering surgery to my patients so in summary uh, subacromial impingement syndrome remains the most common cause of shoulder pain the subject of what is the exact uh, pathogenesis is a matter of ongoing debate and debate still persists regarding the etiology of impingement and its progression to rotator cuff tear and rotator cuff disease probably it is a multifactorial uh, cause and which involves both extrinsic compression and intrinsic degenerative factors and for an isolated subacromial impingement syndrome the treatment remain non surgical with very good successful results obtained at 3 to 6 months period so patient counseling is very important and surgery in the present day as per the available limited evidence it should only be reserved for those who fail non surgical treatment thank you Uh, thank, thank you sir you, you can unshare the screen and uh, we still have around 10 to 15 minutes uh, so we can have some questions and discussions i, I think we have a question from dr mukesh chok and he is asking uh, what is the cocktail of drugs which you use in your subacromial injection so you, i mean Now, I, you can answer maybe itself uh, what is sorry. what is your protocol when you inject So, so I I normally would do just uh, 80 uh, the uh, 2 ml of methyl fitness long that's what I use and I give about 10 ml of uh, local anesthesia as a cocktail in the in the uh, subacromial space but 
uh, I have changed my practice. Till a year and a half back, all my injections were like Dr. Shia said, posterior in the subacromial space. Um, we then had a radiologist who joined our team as an interventional radiologist. Now all my subacromial space injections, I send him send it to him, and I want him to do it. So ultrasound, he did it. He does it through the lateral approach, but um, yeah, because we are doing it under um, uh, under evaluation or rather under inspection, then uh, you know I find that better. It also takes the load off my shoulders. I don't have to leave the OBD seat and it's just being lazy. Uh, the high is uh, into the decommit role. Uh, no, I don't use. I I uh, I have a. I don't know. I you can call it an uh, an a, a complete not a completely logical uh, aversion to high lace, but I don't use it. Yeah, okay. no way. Anybody uh, differs on opinion? So uh, when I was in UK, say around fifteen twenty years ago, as I say mentioned earlier, these injections were used very uh, you know easily. But what subsequent studies on injections have shown? including systematic reviews is that if you are safe doing a one or two local injection or maybe a single steroid injection but if you do repeated or more than one injection you are going to cause damage to the uh, architecture of the rotator cuff or you are going to damage the tendon if there was a partial tear over time so in my practice these injections and as i highlighted to swarnendu's earlier uh, question is that really they are obsolete i think i would use it in as a needs uh, test if required and i would use it in a case of calcific tendonitis and in adhesive capsulitis in the first 3 months when the patient has you know excruciating night pains uh, and you know compliance with physiotherapy because of pain uh, is is a concern uh, but otherwise uh, you know steroids if you look at the uh, level of evidence uh, you know they they uh, they kind of uh, do not recommend the use of uh, steroids in regular shoulder practice uh, talking about high lace injections again they are not supposed to be very effective prp has been tried again with not uh, too much benefit uh, probably it has some role in uh, large or massive rotator cuff repairs to help with the biology but otherwise uh, it is difficult but if and when we do an injections there are uh, studies and i had been one part of one study in the uk the you know ultrasound guided are supposed to be more accurate so you know unless uh, the surgeon is really well versed uh, and well familiar with reaching the right spot uh, ultrasound guided injection is really the right way to ensure that you know you get good uh, uh, you know accuracy in doing this and i think i rightly said i mean uh, you know injection is something which we which was used pretty frequently earlier but i think it's it's better if we use them sparingly Uh, probably a middle-aged housewife, not wanting surgery, not improving the physiotherapy. You are at a dead end. You probably would, you know, do that injection. But not yeah, not. lesser done than when, better. When impingement is essentially anterior and anterior lateral, why would you actually put your needle from back? Why not from the front? You can actually give a bit of uh, local steroid around biceps as well because you are. I mean, never sure the pain is originating from. The bicep tendonitis or impingement or bursa or a part. Okay. Bicep, so bicep, bicep, biceps basically don't biceps basically don't inject in the biceps. Biceps it will groove itself unless and otherwise. By last time, but Shreya, so yes, when you did injection any steroid in the bicep, it will groove itself. Uh, no, right. and again, as I mentioned, I must really emphasize in the present day there is good evidence published which says that ultrasound guided injections are the way. Whether you do biceps or subacromial space or glenohumeral joint, uh, you know, answering IPS's question yeah. about you know why I do it posteriorly. So yeah. as I said, because um, when I used to do it, it was a blind technique, not ultrasound guided. Uh, in order to ensure that I reach the subacromial space, because uh, in my arthroscopy I use that to you know get access to the subacromial space from posteriorly, I have found that it is much easier for me. So it's a very individual thing. and the other uh, limitation from doing it from lateral was that if you have a overhanging acromial or a osteophyte uh, or a spur then your needle will not be able to go through that tight space also in cases of uh, you know adhesive capsulitis if you want to uh, inject in the subacromial space uh, then again i have found in my hands the posterior is easier but having said that both uh, methods are uh, good enough it is entirely operator dependent 
I think I think Shreya, it is just just a melted orientation as because we enter this shoulder arthroscopy from the back side. We know how your how our hand movement will be, and definitely will hit the right spot every time we go either in the intraarticular or subacromial. But it's Samantha, I would say if we are uh, injecting less than two or uh, like one injection in less than two months by our own hands blind, any approach we use is not certain. So. For the young surgeons whom we are actually carrying out this session, we would actually recommend not to give injections without ultrasound guidance. Because oh. even one injection given blind in the partial cuff tear is a disaster for that particular patient. No, no. I, I probably in the last last like, meeting also I told that please don't put any steroid injection unless you are sure by your ultrasound or by <laughs> MRI that there is yeah. a cuff tear. We have to be sure about the needle position, especially youngsters who are starting. Great harm to the patient. Yeah, youngsters who are starting, it is very difficult to be sure about the location of the needle. Once you are experienced enough with maybe 100 scopies under your belt, then you are pretty sure where a needle is going because you are oriented with your cannula, thing, as Dr. Shiyas is saying. But for youngsters, I would really not recommend a blind injection, especially in subacromial region. Maybe for a frozen shoulder in the anterior aspect of the shoulder, they can go straight. Because you are, you know, less likely to hit a cuff in the frozen shoulders if you go and treat it. But for subacromial, I am not a very big proponent of giving a blind injection whatsoever. Let the patient not have pain relief, uh, rather than actually going in with an injection and call and carrying a risk of having a complete uh, progression to a completer. That is what my take is on this. Yeah. Dr. Prabhat, can I just add to what you're saying? Yes. I sir. also do all my uh, injections under ultrasound guidance. I was part of a study uh, uh, in 2009, which we did in uh, SRMC Chennai, ultrasound guided, we put in a blind injection without looking into the guidance, uh, without looking with the, without any guidance. Then our senior radiologist put the probe to see if the tip of the needle is in the subacromial bursal space, that is above the supraspinatus and below the acromion. And uh, shoulder surgeons were doing this and nearly 70% was the accuracy, 30% of the times it was in the frayed superior aspect of the uh, tendinosed supraspinatus. And there is absolutely no injection confidence and the accuracy did not match because the superior fibers are already frayed. And it's like doing a bubble test in our uh, uh, shoulder rotator cuff surgery when you want to identify the bursal surface partial test and we inject saline to do the bubble test. And there is no injection confidence at all. We think we are in the bursa, but actually we are you know, kind of in, uh, increasing the tear size. So what you mentioned is a very valid point. I think ultrasound guidance is the way forward. And uh, lateral approach is what I do. Or be sure about where you're in. And one more thing I would add is that because the space, is, you know, depending on the, uh, the, you know, the appearance and the thickness of the uh, arm, one should use a Venflon because if you just use a needle, it may not reach the subacromial space. So we really need to have something which is long. Uh, like how we do when we do a arthroscopy to ensure that we have reached the space. I, I have a question to the panel. Um, anybody who uses a suprascapular nerve block in conjunction with a pain guy um, so that it makes the physiotherapy easier or it you know increases patient confidence in what they, you know, in your line of management? Uh, any, any, I, any... I, I, uh, I don't do, do the suprascapular nerve block. Mm -hmm. Only for post-operative pain management, sometimes uh, if I'm doing a small procedure and my anesthetist don't want to give a scaling, so I would go ahead and do a, a subacromial decompression quickly and then give a block as well so that there is a pain relief for maybe 10, 12 hours or so. So no, Ashish is asking a different question, IPS. He is asking... Yeah, I understand, but we, we don't do otherwise. Yeah, yeah. In, um, in my practice, the supra, we have a pain team uh, person rather to do these injections. Uh, but it is reserved for adhesive capsulitis patients yeah. who really have, uh, you know, a lot of pain. So apart from that, not routine. Yeah, yeah. We, we started in our, in my practice, we started in frozen shoulder, like you rightly said, in adhesive capsulitis. And then uh, eventually I realized that, you know, most of the nerve uh, pain or the pain distribution is along the course of the suprascapular. I mean, tried it. Uh, I currently have about nine patients. We've tried it on. Um, and it, it probably is a good uh, thing for patients who are not improving with physiotherapy in the initial six to eight weeks. Then then they come back to you because, you know, we, you get a lot of these ladies who are housewife who are working and, you know, they really don't have a substitute for, um, for working in the household and such patient probably works very well in the initial period. And what do you inject them with? 
So mm-hmm. yeah, I asked my pain guys to inject. They they inject a local anesthesia there, so and uh, how long does it last? Like it usually lasts for a day. I mean, they do but it very it well. Is for, it is for twenty four hours. Yes, uh, it usually lasts is... for a day. But that that actually so most of that inhibition which the patient has initially regarding the amount of pain and the physiotherapy they do, and you re- really can do multiple injections. You know, we've given one patient we've given three injections six weeks apart. um it simply in my practice i feel that increases the compliance to your physiotherapy regimen because most of these patients are actually quite quite too much in pain i mean especially the ones who are who have pain at night in particular and they want something uh, you know they are looking at a quick fix um before they want to start with physiotherapy so aditya if the pain does not go with one injection over 6 weeks then we need to rule out uh, any of for advanced pathology so yes. you know, so yeah so i don't use it as a form of treatment per se i what what i normally do is it's just that you know getting that initial apprehension out of the patient i think that most of the shoulder patients do have a lot of apprehension just undergoing physiotherapy and like we know you know most of the shoulder physios at least in my part of the city are not very well trained shoulder physio so you know it just increases their confidence and they can then go ahead with the, the scapula and the uh, rotator cuff strengthening program Shreyas, let me know how often, whenever you do a subacromial decompression, would you actually, if at all you do, would you remove osteophytes from under surface of uh, the acromioclavicular joint? So, how often would you address to the AC joint pathologies? A lot of overlap between uh, AC joint and uh, decompression. So, whenever yeah. you are doing surgery anyway, so would you actually put a lot of attention towards the AC joint as well? The very very good question. uh in cases of isolated subacromial impingement syndrome i routinely would not do it uh, i must also confess that there is uh, a handful of patients whom i would offer surgery for this isolated subacromial impingement syndrome because the majority will get better with uh, physiotherapy for whatever underlying cause scapula or uh, you know just pain or uh, bursitis rather but uh, if uh, i am offering surgery may and most uh, common scenario is in conjunction with rotator cuff repairs so uh, i assess it on mri obviously but i also do an x ray uh, the you know the ap view which is there to assess what is the status of the ac joint and uh, if required then i would do a uh, excision of the lateral end of the clavicle which uh, tends to be around 0.5 cm in a female and uh, up to 1 cm in a male because any more than that uh, as per evidence uh, is so leads to instability and also when i am doing this lateral end clavicle excision i would not uh, uh, kind of uh, damage the superior uh, and the posterior ligaments to prevent any subsequent subluxation uh, but in isolation uh, i hardly ever do this kind of procedure this is just what is mentioned in literature so has it sometime happened to you that you are doing a subacromial decompression and you also had a partial tear and you actually thought that partial tear will heal itself and you just went at the did the decompression and came back and then patient comes back you after maybe 6 months or 9 months and he has got a full thickness tear so does has that happened to you or is it so, one of the scenarios yeah yeah i mean you you're quite this right and so, so maybe bupesh also has seen this so i'll tell you what what happens is that uh, i in the pre operative situation i get my radiologist to uh, comment on whether the partial tear in the cuff is 50% or less uh and uh, i assume that you know the mri has been done within 3 months of me offering them surgery but if it is 6 months or longer then yes i may encounter a situation where i offer subacromial decompression and i accidentally find a partial tear but i use the 50 50 rule which is again what evidence is showing is that if the tear is less than 50% then i will not uh, repair it i will just debride it uh, again it's uh, you know there is no evidence or i don't have any data to say that they won't progress Uh, to a full thickness tear in the future it is just that sometimes if you over treat and you repair a partial tear which is less than if it is near 50% yes i will have a low threshold to repair it while i am there but if it is just uh, you know a surface delamination or in you know, 20% then there has been situation both on articular side and on the bursal side where i would uh, not offer them any kind of uh, rotator cuff repair I would you would you have the same nightmare. threshold for a bursal versus a pasta i mean would you have the same threshold for treating the um, the bursal side as well as the articular side tear so see now bursal tears are more painful than articular sided but mm-hmm. uh, we don't know whether the pathology or the pain is originating because of the bursitis and its nerve endings which are inflamed or is it because of the rotator cuff tear itself 
you know, we don't know whether it's an equal proportion or one is more than the other or there is only one component. So it's very difficult. I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a decision taken on table, but I rely more on the 50-50 rule. It's, if it's near 50%, I will repair it. But if it is 20-30%, then I tend to leave it. I will completely accept with uh, uh, Shreyas here. I think the 50% rule is what really matters. But uh, maybe uh, a few years back, we have all done that uh, subacromial decomposition. The, the reason why I smiled when IPSR asked is, we go in, we find a small tear. We have done a surgery called uh, cuff debridement and acromioplasty and we have come out. And these people have not come back to us. Now our understanding is much better. We are more aggressive in treating. Now we are debating whether we have to do in-situ repair or completion and repair. So, but uh, those people have not come back. But today I will look at the 50% rule. A very simple question to you, Shai, sir. When we are doing a subacromial decompression, I am always tempted to put in a bit of steroid and come out when there is no cuff pathology. Because a lot of bone resection and all that is going to be painful. Now, is the steroid itself very bad or is the local anesthetic very bad to the cuff? Is my question. But I'm always tempted to do that and I've been doing it. In fact, the patient is very happy in the immediate post-op because you've given him some local anesthesia with a steroid shot subacromially under arthroscopic guidance, which cannot go wrong at all. So, do you do that and uh, do you recommend it? So, the answer to that is uh, no for subacromial impingement syndrome. Maybe for an adhesive capsular light is released, I may inject. But again, we don't know that after the procedure, if we inject, it actually stays there or it just gets dispersed uh, you know, into the soft tissue area. Uh, so there is a lot of work done uh, on these injections, be it local anesthetic or steroid from Stanford. Uh, and uh, they have really shown that you know, maybe one injection uh, can be forgiven. But otherwise, if you look at the long-term uh, histology, uh, it really causes more harm than any good. And also these injection uh, benefits tend to remain very short-lived. So, you know, it may feel good in the immediate or uh, the early post-operative period, but that will wear off. So what the patient will experience in terms of pain relief will be because of your procedure and not the injection. So it's Sir, a placebo to the surgeon. I, I don't think it's a placebo to the surgeon. I think it does work for the first 20 years, especially if you're giving a local anesthetic in there. I mean, I'm sure it's going to work, uh, obviously. But I think what Dr. Shias is trying to point out is that, you know, as young surgeons, and like Dr. Zidat had already added, it probably might not be a good idea to rely too much on steroids because, you you know, you're more than certain to make an anatomical change there if you're repeating the steroids again and again. But I I think, you know, I, I, I confess, I do it all the time, Dr. Bhupesh. I mean, what you do, I mean, all... If I'm doing that, I'll probably put in a local anesthesia and steroid. I think yeah, it, it keeps you happy overnight and keeps the patient at least happy overnight. So among one... all seven people of us, has anybody encountered an acromial fracture post a subacromial decompression, maybe done by self or somebody else? Maybe. Or is it an overhype? Uh, it doesn't happen. Piece, I did it happen. Personally, I have not me. encountered any ac acromial fracture after doing the subacromial decompression because you have to be very cautious yeah absolutely so i think the we have to exercise caution when we do this procedure so a couple of points where i would like to add is that uh, i uh, obviously we are all constrained with costs so i tend to reuse birds and so on so when i do the procedure especially in the elderly patient uh, in association with cuff tear i always ask the scrub nurse that is the bird new or old because if it's a new bird it's really going to go very fast and perhaps I may take a lot of the acromion away, even though my intention is just to remove four to five millimeters. So, and again, the speed, the speed has to be really slow uh, to make sure that uh, we don't uh, over enthusiastically remove it. And as I mentioned in my uh, last uh, one, uh, you know, few slides, is that all you have to do is just kind of take away the periostrum from the undersurface of the acromion. You really not don't need to go to the too much of cancellous bone as it was initially thought because you are risking fracture and also you're not uh, offering any advantage by doing that additional procedure. Josh, uh, have you seen tuberosity hypertrophy as well in some patients? So would you actually do tuberoplasty also in some patients? So tuberoplasty, if you look at uh, Dr. Stephen Burkhardt's work, he has advocated tuberoplasty for uh, you know, these uh, massive uh, rotator cuff tears because of the migration. Uh, yes. I think only only in that situation, uh, he recommends it uh, rather than doing an acromioplasty because you have to save the coracoacromial ligament. 
you know to prevent the escape so you would just do a tuberosity but, uh, but unless it's a mal uh, unless it's a mal union so i can uh, you know roughly remember one patient with a proximal humerus fracture uh, where the tuberosity uh, you know was not reduced and it was prominent causing to impingement so in that patient i ended up doing a uh, you know tuberoplasty Oh, that but I think I think IPS that is referring to the this irreparable cups where you cannot do anything. It is just like doing the reverse acromioplasty. Uh, sir, for a summary, I would say, what do you recommend to young surgeons just one year into the scopy of uh, shoulder scopy? When should they consider isolated subacromial decompression, or whether they should, they should actually consider it at all or not? Basically, no, this is our target for basic. What what about those surgeons just one year into uh, shoulder scopy? Isolated subacromial decompression is a very very easy operation, but it is very very hard operation to satisfy the patient. Yes, basically the patient comes back in an OPD with the same pain after two to three months. So, what do you recommend to the youngsters? Whether yes. to do it, not do it, touch it when for the youngsters. So. what i tend to practice and obviously depending on the setup if you are in a government or a public setup there may be certain limitations but uh, clinical examination history taking if i suspect uh, impingement it could be just in isolation or it could be because of uh, underlying cuff pathology so i treat them conservatively assuming that on examination i have found that it is uh, in isolation failing which at 6 weeks i would investigate it in the form of an mri Uh, so that i or you know an ultrasound uh, for others who have that access to know whether is it an advanced problem like a cuff tear which you are missing out uh, what uh, is important is that in in an acute presentation i would do a plain radiograph to rule out calcific tendonitis or you know because things like os acromiale uh, and spurs would not present in the acute setting it would be more of a chronic situation so in a, a one line message to youngsters would be that please rely on a proper detailed history uh, you know and accurate examination uh, do a number of tests which are relevant as highlighted in the talk but still we may not be specific of the pathology and if the patient comes back with a failed uh, conservative line of management in uh, you know 3 months or so then you investigate and offer surgery because otherwise conservative treatment seems to be very effective as per the current evidence Yes, perfect. So I think well concluded. Uh, I think Bupesh has one more question. So Bupesh, uh, last sir, question, and then we can. Yeah, uh, last question. So, what is your uh, take on the uh, critical shoulder angle and subacromial decompression surgery? Do you do it as a part of your pre-op planning? Uh, you know, do you want to remove a lot of lateral acromion so that the uh, CSA comes down and then superior migration of the humeral lid will come down? Is it very theoretical? Is it got a practical implication on our? day to day practice uh, again uh, a a good point so christian gerber described this uh, uh, you know x ray evaluation and if you see most of the work around this is related in relation to rotator cuff tears how can you predict that a certain level of inclination of the acromion uh, so so called rotator cuff index uh, will help us kind of predict that this patient may end up with a rotator cuff tear in the future i don't see much of a role in the situation of subacromial impingement so routinely in my practice i would not do it also as highlighted if you are a believer of the intrinsic uh, etiology then if you over enthusiastically remove the acromion including the lateral part then you are going to cause more compromise on the deltoid because as you remove that you are you know kind of detaching some fibers of the deltoid and causing uh, some amount of uh, disadvantage I think well concluded, uh, Shreyas. It was a absolutely wonderful uh, presentation on a difficult topic, and uh, uh, you did uh, quite a good justice of it. So, any more concluding point, Aditya? I think, sir, most of most of it has already been spoken. So, just briefly summarizing what I think all of us agree on: stay away from steroids. Yeah. Uh, stay away from injections. Um, make sure your conservative plan is exhausted. I think probably let the patient ask for surgery. Rather than offering it more aggressively, yes. and, um, pro- and 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 I think what remain understated, I think the cutting block technique is how you do it. So yeah, you have exactly. to make sure you do it this way rather than randomly moving with the bar inside. So probably those are three take home points I would want the young surgeon. Three more take home points from you for you. Any Siddharth? Siddharth, any Siddharth. point? 
reservation is only for steroids as doctor has has rightly emphasized stay away from steroids with and operate only those patients in whom you feel the result will be there preferably with some coexistent pathology initial stages of her career stay away from isolated arthroscopic debridements beat knee beat shoulder stay away from isolated debridements these are counterproductive you have one unsatisfied patient sitting outside your opd and your morale goes down initial part don't touch isolated decompressions with some rotator cuff pathology take those later on you can take more decisions better to lose a patient than to have an unsatisfied one yeah yeah i completely agree another one point which sreya swatch he highlighted is very good way that don't detach the ca ligament yeah. because ca ligament if you take down because that was the primary if you go, go back to the old bank and the book probably the stage one was the you take off the ca ligament so now the whole thing has been reversed it has been north pole south pole change then even if you go away with the sad don't take off your ca ligament okay if you do that you will be complexing that more case 100 times so i think it was an uh, it's a very informative talk uh, and especially you are talking about scapular dyskinesia uh, one of the very reason important reason for patients coming with anterior shoulder pain is also important which probably is underscored and uh, aditya rightly said that we actually don't observe lot of scapular dyskinesia and uh, your rehab is essentially working on scapula on scapula yes absolutely so that three months of rehab is essentially working on your scapular and scapular thoracic and uh, scapular glenohumeral kinematics uh, very well uh, presented work uh, thank you very much shreyash for uh, spending time and discussing this difficult topic uh, we are all been doing subacromial decompressions for more than 20 25 years now but definitely our numbers of subacromial decompressions have dramatically come down in last couple of years uh, initially we were doing quite a lot and i think uh, literature also is, says that you have to be really very very selective of choosing the right patient so that uh, you are able to give good results to them great so i would also you. like to thank you and uh, swanendra for the invitation and really you know preparing this talk has also uh, got me evidence uh, into this so really it is a learning experience for me as well and i'm i am really thankful to uh, everyone for this opportunity Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Thank if you. we can have the next uh, webinar details here. Uh, so again, thanks to Shreyash. Uh, we have a wonderful webinar which is coming up uh, on Saturday. Uh, this speaker uh, is Dr. Uh, if Shreyash, you can briefly maybe tell about this because sure. you know uh, your personal yeah. experience. So Dr. Gregory De Felis is uh, actually one of the pioneers of bringing in the ACL repair in the last decade. Uh, he's uh, been doing a lot of work in this so you know we will hear it right from the man himself as to when uh, can we think of offering acl repair as an option of treatment uh, for our patients so it's going to be a very uh, informative webinar and you know i'm sure all of us are excited to hear from him absolutely acl repair is something which is new in our armamentarium last couple of years maybe probably we have started doing some bit of acl repairs and hearing in from him uh, is is quite important and would help us in making our understanding much more clear which patients to choose and which are the techniques which are good for acl repair so just tune in on saturday on 12th 